So the best thing to do is when you're 10 years old, start doing everything. And your parents should support that. <laughs> yeah, when you're 10 years old, start doing everything. Start reading. Start being exposed to a lot of things. Right. And life is all about narrowing in. And you narrow into your niche. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Something New. The podcast where we talk about interesting things going on in tech for people building something new. Something new. Or at least people aspiring to build something new. I'm Lior. And I'm Steph. Think of us as a bit of a technical how I built this, but maybe a little bit less Guy Raz and a little bit more Guy Riz. This is the peak, and then we're going downhill from here. (laughs) I'm using my podcast voice. I really we don't have time long enough to really yeah. dive into all the phases that I want. No, I have so many questions yeah. that I want to dive into, but I feel like we don't have the time, which is a tragedy, actually. Yeah, totally. But I figured, um, you know, for for this kind of mini session, um, we talk a little bit, Joel, about your kind of human fountain story. Um, because I had a front row seat, you know, I, I, I start to learn that, um, you know, co-founder someone that i'm doing business with and someone who i'm like in customer meetings with is like gonna eventually be on america's got talent um but before that happened maybe talk to us about so talk to us a little bit about like like your like what happened in high school talk to us about like when you guys you know started posting the videos random places like i'd love yes. to hear like the early Days of human founds, and then we'll we'll describe Wait, kind of also, what human founds was the as well. Or, when did or maybe you guys start you... working together? At what point in the company's life cycle, Joel, yeah. did you just be like, "I need something else" because this is <laughs> <laughs> this is unsatisfying? Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah, totally. Play out um, the whole timeline. Yeah, so yeah, just some some background on it. So, um, Human Fountains is a, a comedy group. Uh, we spit water to opera music is kind of the, the crux of what we do in um, a <laughs> synchronized manner and kind of are inspired by the Bellagio fountain. So think, uh, you know, kind of Bellagio fountains mixed with a blue man group and, you know, the group is still in existence in different iterations and people are still performing the acts. Um, but we, it, it all really got started. We, we made a, we had a, a, a talent show in, in high school. It was for, it was my, my senior year. And we did this, uh, um, human fountains routine. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, worked out really well in the, in the <laughs> show. We, um, made a video shortly after. It was kind of like early, viral youtube days that we made this video i was 18 at the time and and our and our hope was like we thought it was something really unique and and different and funny and we had a lot of fun making it so but we 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 did want it to reach the masses and and you know get viral in in some way we had some success with that video but i wouldn't say it ever initially got viral fast forward eight years later one of the guys in the group uh, posted it on Reddit. I wasn't really so familiar with Reddit's capabilities before then, but he messaged us like 24 hours later and said, we're <laughs> on the top page of Reddit. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, yeah. So we've been working, Joel and I started working like officially yeah. on the company in 2015. We started like ideating in 2014 and like killed <laughs> four ideas or whatever. And then ended um, up with what we, what we worked on. Uh, and then, yeah, I get a, I get a call from him one day, and it's like, hey, we had you know one of the top videos yeah. on Reddit and Vimeo overnight. Uh, yeah, so wow. I think we were in our like three years yeah. to get maybe three or four years into working together, and and the yeah, so yeah. shortly after that, we got a call from the America's Got Talent producers. Um, okay, asking how us. Did if, that, I need to know the details. How did they get your like the call? How did like walk yeah. me through that? That was sort of insane. <laughs> We, so, you know, we saw the video was getting some steam and I think, um, we quickly kind of, you know, made some social media handles, created an email account, got a website up and running, just like some smart, fortunately have like the business expertise to get some of those things going quickly. And, um, one of the other guys in the group is also like in marketing and just, um, does social media and, uh, you know, we were 
quickly getting those things up. And so they were able to, I think, just find us through uh, through one of our channels. And yeah, so we got a message that was like, hey, I'm a producer on AGT. Um, would love to talk to you. So, so you get the call and you start to be, you know, you're on you know, AGT. And I think I want to say something along the lines of Simon Cowell said is like the worst performance what? he's ever seen. And yet you guys... And yet you guys still make <laughs> yeah. it to the live show. <laughs> like, it's the most bonkers, like, confluence of events. I don't know if anyone that I personally have ever known. Like, talk, uh, talk to us yeah. about that so whole, we, like, So arc. we practice a lot. We get the act in, you know, a place we're really excited about. We go on the, you know, audition round. And, and to be honest, I think the expectation was, like, we're going to get buzzed off. And, you know, there's acts that are on the show that, you know, are that just kind of get buzzed and, and, you know, they're, they're there for, to have a good laugh. And, uh, that was somewhat of our expectation. We still wanted to, again, 100% go for it and do our best. Um, and the crowd like really, really enjoyed it. I and four of the judges loved it. And Simon though, X us and hated it. And he said, it was, it was the worst act he's ever seen. He said it was the one thing he later on, on later rounds in the show said we were the stupidest act that's ever been on the show and like to us i mean what we do is very in a form of comedy called clowning and like that's a huge compliment i'm curious i guess this is a little bit more of a a serious question but there have been some folks lately um the one i'm thinking of is like the talk to a girl i forget her actual name but also who knows her real name do you guys you guys know what i'm talking about a girl that went super viral yeah, you know, has this whole yeah, podcast. Um, and I feel like there are yeah, other yeah. recent examples even from this year. And you had mentioned earlier, Joel, about how you noticed as soon as you guys went viral, which is, you know, virality is really hard to control. Although I think you guys are also smart about knowing, like, what would resonate with folks. But um, assuming that you have, like, a viral moment that's maybe unexpected and you were coaching someone today who had that happen today, what would you recommend them do to capitalize on that moment? Um, like, you mentioned social media and a bunch of other things. But, like, what's, what can someone do to maximize that opportunity, that open doors, like, AGT or fame. Yeah, that's, <laughs> or money. That's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, first off, like, um, Seth, one of the kind of questions you asked was like, how did they find you? So definitely, I mean, this is like, I work with uh, companies quite a bit or help content creators and stuff. And sometimes it's like, they don't even have a contact in their profile. So that's like the most basic thing, but you'd be surprised how many people kind of overlook that or it's not so easy to get in touch with them. So that's like a very simple thing. And then even like kind of taking a step back, if you have a viral moment, I would, and you like want to capitalize on it, I would try to ask yourself like, what does capitalizing even mean? Like in our case, I think we just wanted people to see us and see the video. And that honestly was was enough. Like that, that was really our initial goal. Like we created this thing we were really proud of, we were really excited about, and we just, wanted people to to see it so you know trying to get people to share it and and putting it out there um but if you're trying to you know like grow a big social media following and that's your goal and you make something that's viral i would say like just study that video see what worked well see what was good about it try to build off of that make other content that is similar but something i would tell anyone if they're making content or want videos to do well also just make sure that you're enjoying doing it i know it's like probably a little cliche but having made a lot of content and a lot of videos it's that is so important so i i really preach like don't just try to make things with that intention sure like might change the style or the setup that you're doing it but figure out why you're making it like what it means for you to have more eyeballs on it, why you want that, and make sure that you're having fun. I think the other things can kind of fall into place. There, so, you know, there's a lot, maybe we'll wrap up with this because there's a lot of accomplishments. Like post AGT, like y'all are performing at like got talents around the world. Like, I don't know, more than a dozen, like I think Lithuania, maybe Japan, Mexico's got talent, like all these got talents. Like it's completely insane. You got a TikTok that ended up having like a million followers. You ended up becoming like one of the top videos on like Chinese TikTok at some point, uh, which is pretty crazy. There's all, all sorts of stories, but the story that maybe we can end with is maybe talk to us about performing at a celebrity's <laughs> girlfriend's cat's wedding. 
Um, I yeah. thought that's a particularly uh, memorable. No, uh, <laughs> but we we wrote like a hour long show that uh, you know it was a little more storytelling. Some of our acts that we did on these TV shows, but we initially premiered it at a festival in Los Angeles, and Shia LaBeouf came to the show. Um, wow! So he, yeah, so he came, saw the show was was a a very big fan really really enjoyed it um and a year and a half later uh we kind of still kept in touch with him we we bumped into him on on our street uh and he's he was like oh like god i'm so excited to see you and my my girlfriend she was like around the corner we're having a a cat wedding which is exactly actually what it sounds like two cats (laughs) We're getting married. Oh my and god! Any chance you, you would you would all perform? And yeah, that was maybe the most uh, interesting, different place that uh, we performed. I don't think I will. Eh, I wouldn't say never, but uh, a rare opportunity to perform <laughs> at Shia LaBeouf's girlfriend at the time's cat wedding. Wait, before we wrap, Joel, I feel like they're the type of person who creates, you know how you, people talk about like creating your own luck? I feel like you you strike me as someone who creates a lot of your own luck. What's your advice to Good. people, founders, whatever, on yeah, doing that? Yeah. Don't get in your own way as much as possible. I think uh, I've kind of had a philosophy, like if you want to start something, then the best way to do that is by doing it. And with that, like there was there was one comment that always kind of stuck in mind with me of like somebody writing on our our video on on YouTube, which was like, "So you're telling me all I have to do is get a couple friends together and spit water, and I can get on national TV?" And I think like over time, when I've thought about that comment, it, like the answer is is yes. I think just being comfortable in in your skin and and taking risks, and you know, we were okay to get on that stage and know that we might just get X and, and laughed at, but that didn't stop us from doing that. And I think that's the same with, with other companies and starting things. Like I've certainly started things that a year or two years later, like don't pan out and that, and that's okay. Um, and like worst case scenario, I've built a lot more tools and a lot more skills. And I learned more about another industry and I got a ton more experience. So I think that's, really the case with with starting anything and is like being okay that it might not work out but that does not mean it's a failure in any way oh absolutely awesome thanks so <laughs> much Joel. so fun yeah, awesome, to you Joel. both thanks and, so um, thanks so yeah this this has been something new <laughs> <laughs> wait also we are <laughs> <laughs> we might we might use that permanently <laughs> we have to do the intro too Anyway, introducing today's guest is um, we have Jacob Jabber. Um, he's a co-founder of Phil's, the iconic SF Bay Area originated coffee shop, but now they're national, hopefully soon to be New York. Um, and uh, I really loved his story, actually. He actually co-founded Phil's with his dad, um, who originally founded the convenience store that turned into the coffee shop that Phil's is now. And something I thought was super cool is that he took over as CEO um, Jacob did um, as CEO of Phil's at 17. And needless to say, it's not only become an SF staple, but they've since also raised tens of millions of dollars from iconic growth and private equity shops like Summit and a bunch of others. And anyway, hearing not only about the growth journey of Phil's from like very humble beginnings to where it is now, um, and also his thoughts on kind of hospitality and investing in the space in general, um, now with an investor advisor and founder has been really, really cool. Um, so without further ado, Jacob. Um, well, Jacob, thanks for joining <clears throat> us today. Super excited to chat. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah. I mean, why don't we just start? I know you and your dad founded Phil's. I was interesting to learn that Phil is, is literally named after your dad, which I thought was super cool. Love to hear more about that founding story and yeah, a little more about how Phil's came to be today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Phil is my dad and, uh, he came to the States when he was a teenager from the Middle East. And, you know, a uh, story that we've all heard, the, the immigrant immigrant sh- struggle starting with nothing, trying to create a good life and having opportunity. And he uh, he worked with his brother who had a little convenience store in Alameda, California, which is close to San Francisco. And 
he was going to school. He didn't really like school, but he was helping him out. And then eventually when he was 21, he opened his own corner store, grocery store, like a bodega in the Mission District in San Francisco. And his family was like, you're so stupid for doing this. And he was just like, well, why? There's four other, at that time in the Mission District, there was like four other bodegas within a block and a half radius. And they're like, why would you do that? You know, everybody, there, there's so much competition. He was like, they're focused on selling products. I'm going to be focused on serving the community. So yeah. I'm really going to get to know my customers and make sure I adjust and curate and serve them in the best way that's possible. So we did that and it started working out pretty well and then had some rough spots. But he was always passionate about coffee and experience um, back home. It was all about community and gathering and family and connecting over the table with food and coffee and tea and conversation. And at the bodega, you know, people buy stuff and leave and he wanted people to stay for a while. So he thought about coffee because he liked coffee. He thought about the experience in the community and slowly started transitioning the store from a bodega to a coffee shop. I've been in the business since I was nine years old when it was a bodega before it was a coffee shop. I was uh, at the time I was short to reach the cash register. So I stood on top of two milk crates and rank people up at the register, learn how to interact with customers, learn how to count change back, uh, learn how to stock inventory. And I hated school and I hated school because I felt like I was forced to learn stuff I wasn't interested in from people who weren't that interesting. So I never really did good in school, but I did love learning. And I felt like I got a lot of learning and fun and excitement out of working with my dad at the store, you know, after school. And, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit. Uh, my dad created a little coffee station in the back of the store to start testing it out. So before just like opening a coffee shop, it's like tested out uh, these special blends that he created in a handmade process and he would have his customers, you know, they'd buy like a gallon of milk or a carton of eggs or a pack of cigarettes. And he'd be like, Hey, I'm working on this new coffee. I'd love to you to try it and give me some feedback. So slowly, but sur surely they tried it. They loved it. And that's it. That's how it all started with a little coffee station in the back of the bodega. And then we removed an aisle from the bodega and took furniture from our house. Cause we didn't have a lot of money to work with. And like, you know, customers were sitting at our kitchen table. So my sisters and I would wake up in the morning and be like, where's the breakfast table? Where's the couch? <laughs> Every week, there'd be a new set of furniture taken out of the house and put into the shop. But that's how wow. it started. It was very organic. And uh, I dropped out of school. I was like 17 and worked full time with my dad. And, you know, it was, we was not busy to start with. And we just, he gave me the opportunity to run the business at that point too, and wow. be the CEO at 17. Uh, oh wow! I did not know he, that. That's super. Yeah, cool. no, he he wanted me from the very beginning to 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 run the business and work on creating it together, and we just worked at it seven days a week, twelve hours a day, hustling. It took many years before it started to catch, but that was the story, the founding story. I'm so curious. Uh, you know, I hear we hear a lot about, especially. I mean, uh, Lou and I joke about this, but you know, having graduated from an MBA program where like a ton of people are doing like search funds and stuff, a lot of the businesses that people are buying are kind of like family run businesses that, um, you know, the owners are retiring and want to pass on to their kids, but their kids don't want to run the business, for example, or you know, that transition isn't possible for them. Um, and so maybe it's about two parts of your story. One is just you know how organically it seems like you and your dad work together so well from the very beginning, and that you grew to love the business and like really embrace it versus kind of wanting to branch off and do your own thing. And then two, even, you know, I mentioned this, um, you know, in our previous email exchange as well, but, uh, you know, I come from a, a family with immigrant parents as well. And like the last thing they would ever allow me to do is like drop out of school to pursue, you know, the unknown. And so I find that really inspiring and very interesting. I'd love to hear more about that and what you think. Maybe your situation was unique in that way. And that'll, you know, spark your yeah. passion. You know, the truth is that I personally, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure. Like whenever you're in it, you're never sure, you know, from a distance, everybody looks at you. It's like, oh, this person's so sure about what they're doing. No one's really sure. And you're kind of figuring it out along the way. Rarely do you get the moment where you're kind of sure and you stick with it and you go with it. Um, that happened for me, but it took time to get there. So yeah. I kind of had to dance and float around and try different things. And 
the beauty of running the business is there's so many facets of it. There's some, there's some things you like more than others. Um, and there were some things I really liked and there's some things I like less. And I, you know, figured out how can I, you know, use a great team to help me on the things I like a little bit less so I can spend time on the things I like doing more. And it kind of just worked out. So the more general you can be, I think the better earlier when you're younger, it's better to be exposed to a lot of different things. And to not feel the pressure of the timeline of school correlating with your need to figure out the perfect thing, right? It's like you go to school, it's like after college, you're supposed to, it doesn't work like that. So the best thing to do is when you're 10 years old, start doing everything (laughs) and your parents should support (laughs) that. (laughs) Yeah. When you're 10 years old, start doing everything, start reading, start being exposed to a lot of things. And life is all about narrowing in and you narrow into your niche. So narrow into your niche. Don't force it. If you start out too narrow, you might be missing something out. Um, So I'm a big fan of that. It's like, get on a big road, drive a lot, move around, and then just uh, listen, observe your energy and follow your energy. So if your energy is, is, is good in one area, do more of that. If it's bad in one, do less of that and just keep working at it and keep working at it. But you got to be motivated and driven. Right. You got to be motivated and driven. And that innate drive is uh, what I think differentiates uh, the people who get maximized success. Uh, you know, because you, you know, a lot of people are lazy and that's okay. I yeah. think that's fine. <laughs> <I'm> gonna... <laughs> that, that's up to them. Everyone's personal decision, but you should never complain about not being successful if you're lazy. So you got to, there's no, we could argue about this and I don't even know how I feel about it totally, but there's something that I really like about it, which is there's no inherent uh, purpose of life. So you have to find that for you. And I think everybody's uniquely themselves and individual. So find your purpose and stick with it and go forward. You know, to, to that end, you know, a lot of people come at like, you know, starting a business with different kinds of experiences, like post, you know, high school, they'll do a bunch of different things. And when I, mean, I was reading that maybe other than like a quick short stint at Abercrombie and Fitch, when you were like 15, yeah. for the most part, you're coming at business building from like a first principles perspective, whereas other folks might have kind of done like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, like in their 20s, and then eventually come around to building a business. How do you kind of weigh, you know, coming at Phil's from like a from a first principles perspective versus like, picking and learning different things that other organizations have done and trying to kind of create an amalgamation of different qualities. How do you kind of think about that balance? Regardless, if you're scaling a company, you need to bring in some level of expertise and experience because you hit a wall, right? You can go pretty far without that being a smart, energetic, uh, you know, founder who knows, you know, who, who thinks in a first principles ways, who use common sense, but eventually, as you scale and grow, you have to surround yourself with people who can help your blind spots and help you level up and scale. I think the art is in knowing when to listen to yourself versus listen to the experts. And that is not a black and white thing. That is really a gray area. And you have to have the judgment. So what then becomes the most valuable thing is it a leader is judgment. You know, is this something that we need to think about from scratch? Payroll software. I don't need to go and reinvent the wheel with payroll software. Let me go use the best payroll. You know, unless I'm a payroll company, maybe I need to think about it differently. But if I'm a coffee shop or a restaurant or another business. So you got to really pick and choose the core areas where you think it's important to innovate and create newness and transform versus the areas where you just pick and choose the stuff that's off the shelf that maybe is incrementally better than the next. Um, So I think the key is just not delegating your thinking to others. And sometimes when you're scaling and growing so quickly, you don't have a lot of time. So that's why you have to have good people around the table and trust their judgment. So you're really delegating judgment. Uh, But yeah, um, there's, there's, there's no other way to build something great than to do it from a first principles standpoint where you question everything. Uh, And that's really how you can make a big difference and create something better, a better alternative than what's out there. Super interesting point. The the, the nuance I think that maybe some of our our listeners would love to learn from you is that, you know, in the service industry, some of what you're innovating on 
is the service itself. And I think there was a quote you had where excellence is specific and, and specificity comes from, from service and comes from knowing a specific individual. So I'd love to hear not only how you thought about innovating against service, but also how do you, you know, imbue that, you know, mindset across now, you know, you know, you know, uh, almost a hundred stores or whatever the number is today. You know, you got to do things that are authentic to your brand and yourself, right? So for us, we're very passionate about hospitality. My dad would always call it grandma's house hospitality. So what does that mean? We want people to feel, you know, when you go to grandma's house, oh my God, she loves you, right? She'll (laughs) hug you. She wants to give you $20. She wants to feed you, you know, know, just all love, right? Uh, Making sure you're totally happy, you're welcome, you're comfortable. Um, So we wanted to create that, that environment in the stores. So that wasn't necessarily about the design of the stores, maybe a little bit. It was mostly about the type of people you hired. You know, people who had that inherent hospitality, that love for people and connection. And there's a difference between customer service and hospitality. Customer service is a little bit more tactical. It's a little bit more transactional. And it's very important to do good customer service. But hospitality is like the antithesis of technology. Hospitality is about uh, the human spirit. It's about uh, touching someone. It's about uh, being present with someone. Um, The greatest gift you can give someone is your attention, your full and undivided attention. So great hospitality starts with your full and undivided attention. Great hospitality is about observing and anticipating. You know, uh, we have customers who we met once and we knew exactly what they liked. We saw them walk across the street. We started their order before they walked in. Uh, We, you know, it's, it's all about that personal touch. Um, So that meant that in order to scale that hospitality, we needed to be really, really great at people. Uh, What type of people do we hire? How do we hire? How do we increase our accuracy rate and get the right people? How do we train really well? And then how do you lead? So we created a, a people playbook, hiring, training, and leadership. And we're very intentional, thoughtful about each dimension and make sure we just kept iterating and getting better in each dimension, all in service of that hospitality that we're trying to deliver. And the truth is, is very difficult to do uh, because, you know, you're you're dealing with people, you're dealing with hourly workforce, you're dealing with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, competitive pressures. The good news, I would say, is you don't need to be good at a lot of things. You just need it. You need to know what you need to be the best at. Mm. And the good news is it's only that's usually only a couple of things. So the sooner you've got to identify those things and this, and the more you can obsess on those things and worry a little less about the things that matter less, I think the better. For us, it's don't mess with the quality, be great with people, choose good real estate. You know, if you did these three things, the probability of success is really, really high. I'm actually curious, like on that point, um, you mentioned, you know, kind of earlier, like hospitality and giving a lot of attention to the customer. It's almost like kind of like the, you're right, it's like the opposite of kind of the technology and the VC hustle, like constantly trying to optimize every single moment and the, you know, uh, volume of people you have it and how fast you can get them in and out of the store. Uh, And I'm curious as someone who not only invests in this category now, but who took investment for fills, I'm curious if you ever felt that tension as you guys scaled and and continue to grow, not only in regards to, you know, building out your team, which obviously is uh, a very hard thing to do at scale as well, but even just pressure from investors or needing to kind of hit certain OKRs or metrics or whatever it is. I'm curious about how you balance that um, or if you face any pressure to to balance that. Yeah, we, you know, we hired our investors kind of like we hired the team. We wanted people to invest in, in the vision and the mission of Phil's. And I think we did a pretty good job at that. And there's certainly pressure from that, but never, never bad pressure. I think the investors understood what made Phil special and wanted to preserve that. There was good, healthy pressure in other areas. And how do we grow? How do we do this right? How do we build a great business? All good, all good stuff. So I don't think that changed in any way. I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, when you bring a diverse, uh, you know, set of people around you, you actually learn a lot more. And sometimes you want to you want to manufacture some level of tension where you can debate strategies and tactics, but you don't 
move away from your mission and your values. So you really stay firm on your vision, your mission, your values, but you stay pretty flexible on the best way to get to where you want to go. And how do you, you know, how do you not just have a great culture, but also how do you have a great business? So I would say um, you got to choose your investors wisely. You got to be very uh, transparent and forthright about, uh, you know, what, what matters and what the values are. Um, And, you know, I, I would say it's, it's probably a bad or a dumb investor. If an investor came in and kind of like, you know, a good investor knows before they invest those two or three things that really, really matter ahead of time. Um, and, and, and that, then that's good. That usually is smooth sailing. But if you get like an investor who, you know, on your eighth board meeting, um, let, you're going to face a problem, right? And they misdiagnose and they apply, you know, and they have seniority in some ways because sometimes investors are older than the entrepreneurs especially if, you know, you, you get some experienced ones, they misdiagnose, right? So that's, that's dangerous. Like it, you want to be like a good doctor where you diagnose, then you prescribe. Um, so make sure when you, you're going to face problems in your business, make sure you diagnose the right problem so you can have the right prescription. If you misdiagnose, you might go to an area you shouldn't be messing with that may seem like the prescription, but it's not. So this is why you got to hire investors like you hire your team, um, but also be open, you know, be open to being challenged in the right areas, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm actually curious. Do you have any examples of a way an investor has challenged you and helped you guys in a good way uh, in regards to yeah. your business? Yeah, I mean, OK, so here's a good one. So we at, originally at Phil's had two sizes. We had a small and a large and we love just having two. I wish we just had one size because it's easier and you could less training, right? Because it's very complex to have another size because right. oh, it's a different sugar level, it's a different cream level, it's a right. different coffee level. So you, you got to remember more things and there's more drinks and those are treated differently. So we had two sizes to keep it simple, which supported simplicity and training and quality. Um, um, and you know, there was a point where we kind of had to raise our prices, but we thought about, is there another way to increase the average ticket without having to raise prices, but also delighting consumers and giving them more options and value? So one of the investors had the idea of adding a size. And as an entrepreneur, my initial reaction was just burning. It's like, (laughs) shit, we're not doing that, you know, (laughs) but, but I tried to be really open-minded about it. And, uh, thought that, you know, maybe I'm wrong here. And we became open to the idea. We did it and it worked great. And yeah, it added a ta- the, the, the amount of complexity. And this is where I, I had to re- refine my thinking on is the amount of complexity added was well worth the value that came. And that was the yeah. equation that I didn't preemptively think through. So that's a great example of where, uh, I wouldn't have done that without, uh, you know, a little encouragement from the investors. And I did, and I'm glad. And it reduced us having to raise prices uh, that much, which is which okay. is great. So that's one example. There are other examples. There are examples on the opposite end where I didn't listen, and I'm glad I didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> like that. the Phil's I mean, mobile not- app is a good example. Uh, so mm. I was crazy, man. I... Every little corner and centimeter of that app, I was obsessed about making sure the designer was right. And the app wasn't about an app. It was about solving the need state for giving consumers convenience. People want Mm -hmm. their fills, but sometimes they need predictability and convenience to capture it because they don't have time to wait. So there are people who walked into the store for the experience, and then there are people who wanted the convenience. People were not coming as much as they wanted to because they couldn't wait. So this is the, that was the diagnosis. And then the prescription was having a way to give convenience to our consumers. So then that's how we came up with the app, but we wanted to do it in an on-brand and on-experience way. We wanted to make sure it was done in a conversational tone, a personalized tone, true to the brand. You know, you get to see every barista and they ask you to take a sip when you're leaving Phil's 
Um, mm-hmm. So I wanted to create that experience on the app. And obviously, we're not a tech company, right? We're a product, we're, we're a coffee company, um, but we embrace tech. So, uh, you know, we found great people to build it out. But during the process of building it, it was quite expensive, but it was hard. We went through a lot of rough patches to the point where things were delayed because I was so particular about small things. Like I wanted every customer to see the barista that was making their coffee on the app. And people were like, well, how are you going to do that? Well, you have to integrate with scheduling. You have to do all these things. And I remember people just putting a lot of pressure on me at one point of like, this is ridiculous. This is costing so much. This is... And then this I, I the kind point. of, you know, I, I kind of got up and said, this is how we're doing it. Period. Conversation over. <laughs> and we did it. And I'm glad we did. We got so much great, great feedback from people about that feature. But you got to know when to be open well, and you got to know when to be firm. As as a Phil's app user, uh, I, I've, I've always beautiful. loved that experience. It's a beautiful yeah. app. And then also- Well, like I'm the- never satisfied, actually. I think it could be yeah. a lot better, but I'm always- I have problems. I'm always looking at the bad stuff. Uh, of course. But, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad, to, I'm glad to hear you like it. I, uh, you at least have one fan. Uh, I'm sure you have many more. But you know, but it, but but to that end, though, you know, you you have the names of the the, the baristas who are who are providing the the coffee itself. But uh, you kind of alluded to this earlier. But would love for you to double click on the process of like finding the type of person who is amenable to this, like to the whole ser- like service and hospitality experience. Like, and you have this person who, you know, wants to take part in like that part of the transaction, you know, whenever I would walk in that, that person would, would say something nice. We'd have a quick exchange and it did make my day better. But at the same time, you're, you're having to identify and then train that individual against those principles. Like what are the things that you were looking for ahead of time, you know, uh, to, to find those individuals who are willing to engage both of the in-app experience with, in, with the kind of in-house experience completely that were were able to kind of meet your level of liking on that front? It's a great question. And the paradox is like, it's, it's very, it's counterintuitive actually, because the more work you have to do, the wronger, the, the more wrong the answer. <laughs> so it should be easy. It yeah. should be really easy. What I mean by that is, um, and we did it in the early days, we stopped and then I kind of went back to it. But in the early days, when somebody wanted, when we wanted to hire someone, instead of fill out a resume, fill out an application, let's schedule a time, you know, all this BS, it's like, that's unnecessary, particularly for the environment we're in. I shake their hand, I shake my hand. I tell them, hi, I'm Jacob. What's your name? I get to know them. And I say, you're interested in working here? They say, yes. I say, jump behind the counter, start helping me. And let's spend the next hour working together. Let's see how it is. And no training. And you kind of see how how they do. And you kind of have to like separate someone's shyness or nervousness. Don't let that cloud your assessment of the underlying potential of that person. So you got to know how to, because people are nervous and shy sometimes. Just because someone's nervous and shy, you can't write them off. You got to be able to see beyond that. So I tried to see beyond that. And if the person was the uh, the best people in hospitality have an innate sense for it. They have taste. They have the judgment. Uh, and they did a great job. And it, it, the more natural and the less work that I had to do, the better the person was at hospitality. So obviously that may not be the most scalable approach to hiring people, but you take the spirit of that and you're like, okay, we got to spend a lot of time on finding people who have that innate skill set and passion for people and hospitality and service, you know? Um, So there was a lot of different tests and iterations and different characteristics. We weighted, we prioritize. But really what it came down to is the two most striking characteristics that correlated with someone who worked out great is kind and driven. Kind is they're opening the door for you without, you know, you see them opening the door for someone. There's a little napkin on the floor. Everyone walks by, they see it and they pick it up. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not involved, you know, they say hi to people and they look at you in the eye, you know, they shake hands this with with the janitor just like they do with the person in the suit yeah so just kindness good
good kindness and then drive is they want better for their life. They're not satisfied. They want better. So when you have these two things working together, it makes for great hospitality. I'm curious about, um, I know you also, or I think full-time now, you run Humble Lion Holdings. Is that right? You transitioned out of yeah, Phil's so now. Phil, well, no, I'm still still on the board of Phil's chairman, uh, help the team out here and there. We have a good management team running the day-to-day, but Phil's is definitely still, you know, I go to stores, I interact with the team, cool. I'll make coffee if I need to, uh, although less these days, but uh, uh, helping out from that capacity. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm spending my time on Humble Lion Holdings. Uh, yeah, which tell is us more very about exciting. it. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, it's so funny. Like with Phil's, you know, we started in Silicon Valley and we kind of grew up in Silicon Valley. So I got so much exposure to tech. So I was at this odd intersection where it was like very much in this physical brick and motor, old school, old school business, but also highly exposed and integrated into leading edge technology really smart entrepreneurs, venture capital, and I embrace them both. And I embrace them both. So over the years, you know, organically, I've met so many great entrepreneurs and investors and got exposed to, you know, investing, you know, at small levels, but investing and helping out. So I've been doing that organically for over a decade, uh, but not, you know, more passively, not, not actively. And I loved it because, I love the zero to one stage. Uh, I think, you know, when you scale a business, it's fun and exciting, but the management is not the most fun sometimes. Going from zero to one is very exciting. And uh, I have a good pulse on how to do that. Um, But yeah, I mean, everything from consumer technology to brick and motor, I've done that. But Humble Line Holdings is now thinking about, okay, what are what's the future of brick and motor? You know, what does it look like in the next 20 years or 30 years? Civilization has advanced a lot, right? For the most part. Like we can click a button and we can get a burger, right? We is like Amazon nowadays I order an Amazon <laughs> package and it's here at night, right? I order in the morning and it's this is pretty luxurious. And there's a lot of people in the world that are way behind and whatever we can do to help bring them to a good standard that we have. We're so lucky. We're so fortunate. So then you're like, and then a lot of the innovation has been happening digitally, right? And AI is this new transformative technology that is going to permeate everything we do. But a lot of the innovation has been on the screens. There hasn't been a lot of innovation physically. Innovation may not look the same for physical businesses and structures than it does in technology. And I think it's uh, not accurate to say that you, know, you, you treat innovation in a digital world the same way you treat it in the physical world or like try to force force it on it. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess my point is that I don't know that the world needs a better burger or a better coffee, but if, if, if you're going to do it, it needs to be much, 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 much better. Yeah. So... Um, the whole the way I look at everything is through the lens of two dimensions, different and better. Yeah. So you need something that's different and you need something that's better. If you have something that's better but not different, that's good because you're better, but you don't have a lot of defensibility there, right? Maybe if you're like five times better or ten times better, that's really good. But if you're not different, it's going to be really hard to maintain that that lead. If you're just different and you're not better, you don't matter because you have to be better. So there's the two dimensions and then there's the depth of the dimensions. So you can be a little bit different and a little bit better. That's a weak position. You can be a lot different and a lot better. That's a strong position. So I'm always evaluating concepts and ideas through the lens of the depth of the two dimensions of different and better. So now if you kind of zoom in a little bit more on the areas that, that, that I'm focused on, uh, there's three areas, which is, uh, and they're all brick and motor, but very much embrace technology and digital. So Omni is fine. But if it's just like an app business or technology or digital business, maybe I'll look at it, but I'm not, that's not my primary focus. So brick and motor is key. Food and beverage is one, but much better food and beverage, much different. Mm-hmm. 
and there needs to be an experience component to it. So that's one area. And then, then the other thing is like, uh, uh, I think it's important to be better for you, right? Like you should mm-hmm. never, like no food or beverage brand should be created if it's not actually better for you. Good. You know, it needs to be better for you. Sometimes that can mean a treat where calorically and from an ingredient standpoint, it's not the best, but it brings you a little bit of joy. But for the most part, it needs to be better for you. Um, ideally, it's better quality, better convenience, better price, better experience. So that's the bar for that is really high because it's very competitive. The next area is uh, IRL community. Is people I didn't even know what mm-hmm. IRL meant until a, a year and a half ago, and then I started using IRL. But like <laughs> real life community, right, is what it is. It's it's really just you know uh, people gathering. So I think that uh, more in the pandemic taught us this very much. But being around other people is enriching. Having a community, a real community, is important. That's the second one, and the third one is experiences and entertainment. Community in some ways touches both. It could be its mm-hmm. own, but on the experiences in entertainment, if you think about like these department stores, like the JC Penney's and of the world, et cetera, like that's so much square footage that's wasted over time. A lot of that space is going to need to be rationalized. And I think it's going to be reallocated to not just like food and beverage or apparel or Lululemon or aloe. It's going to be social competitiveness, socializing, connecting, you know, playing games, being around with friends. So those are the three areas that I'm primarily focused on. I get organically a lot of stuff that comes my way that I'll look at that sometimes doesn't fit those, but uh, I see the biggest opportunity in that. Very cool. Laura and I talk a lot about, um, you know, a lot of VCs or YC, well, how like an ask for startups, like things that they're excited about, that they're actively looking for teams um, who are building those areas. Are there any concepts that you're particularly excited about that you're looking for a team to invest in or something hypothetically, if you had more free time, you would try to go build yourself because you believe in the opportunity yeah and i always i always think about like the you know i don't know if you guys have been to greece or italy like the villages and the town squares it's so interesting also when you go to the cafes in europe the seats are kind of facing outside whereas in america the cafes everybody's kind of inward Mm -hmm. so there's something about the european culture where you know life uh, socializing is, uh, prioritized, you know, a a little bit more, um, you know, how do you bring that here, uh, to America without sacrificing the ambition and the innovation and all that, but it would be really cool, you know, like those little town squares Mm -hmm. with all those umbrellas with a water fountain, you know, that movie, Luca, the Disney movie, it's a great movie. I always (laughs) envision like, how do you, how do you bring that? How do you bring that to pockets of neighborhoods and places yeah. um you know people might say oh maybe the parks maybe the parks that but i think there's a a way to bring uh, and it doesn't have to be massive but a town square to communities like communities hub gathering place so that's one area i don't know exactly what that looks like but that's one area um yeah another area is just uh if you think about like fast food it's very interesting because it feel like you, it feels very antiquated, right? And then the, you have the rise of the fast casuals, like the Chipotle's and the Cava's, which are really good. But yeah, how do you deliver on high quality, clean food mm. at affordable prices, um, family friendly? I think that that's 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 actually an an area an area too that I think is interesting. Um, but again, these are these are some ideas that are still still in motion, and I it's I haven't really seen I've seen some aspects of it, but I haven't seen anybody executed on the way. It's like okay, that's it. Yeah, how much of it is like you know you have like the liquid deaths and the five hour energy of the world that almost try to win on 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 brand on some dimension. Although I think at the beginning, five hour energy was was different. And then you also have like the top cost of the world that you mentioned. There's a new bar in Dallas that basically charges like. You know, uh, like as if you're going to a sports game, it's almost like a mini version of the Las Vegas sphere. And you're watching like a sports game as if almost it feels like you're, you're there uh, and they can yeah. charge almost like kind of half price stadium tickets and people are willing to pay for it because it's a pretty killer experience. And so they're kind of innovating on like space and real estate. Um, and there's like kind of a technological element. So curious when you think about like new things that you're evaluating, 
you know, how much of it comes down to brand, how much of it comes down to kind of real estate, how much of it comes down to technology? Like, how do you think about like that, that triad, so to speak? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think it really is situational and it depends on the idea and you kind of have to evaluate the idea and just find out what are the things that are really, you know, wh- what are the important important kernels of the idea yep. and sometimes technology and brand are weighted a little bit more heavily yep. um it, timing is important too i think yeah you know the whole why now question um but i also uh go against that too and say timing is not important so right. it's, i i think timing is important so this is where i'm confused but i think timing is important yeah. and, and then it's not not important and it's it's not that i'm confused it's that i think it's important to do timeless things yeah but there's a better time to do things. I mm. guess that's the right way to think about it. Yeah, you, yeah, you want to find timeless things, but you want to do it at the right time. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that, that touches on your question, but I really evaluate each idea a, on its own and then try to decide and learn from the entrepreneur what is it that's that's really important. Um, you know, Liquid Death is a good example in their case is how the hell do you dif- differentiate Right. So they needed to have a bold, highly bold approach, um, you know, to 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 that. And I very clever, actually, very then, clever, very surprising, too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I never, know, yeah. but, you know, <laughs> I would never have guessed it. Yeah. Yeah. But it just goes to show you uh, that this idea of like different, you need it. You need yeah. to have something that's different. It's a good question. Is it better? You know, inside what's inside the can? I don't know if it's better. No, what's outside the can? I think it's I don't know. Yeah, on that third component, real estate. You know, I think that's the one component we haven't touched on as much. You know, uh, the sneaky the sneaky fact is a lot of these businesses, brick and mortar, and also logistic. Like many many businesses are are real estate businesses, or that's a big piece of the pie. Curious what you've learned on that front. Uh, are you someone who likes to take chances as it relates to real estate and locations, or are you someone who likes to you know buy the the Park Avenue equivalent, I guess, of, of any given city. How do you think about about real estate on uh, for brick and mortar in, in general? Yeah, it's super important. Uh, you know, having the right look, like you y- you can fix a misstep in execution or in marketing, but you can't really fix a misstep in location. Like great marketing can't fix a bad location. And it depends. Like if you're a really good restaurant, I think the specific location matters a little bit less. The really? micro, the macro matters a little bit more, like being really? in the neighborhood close enough to the right demographic yeah. versus being on that block versus that block. <laughs> I think restaur- restaurants mm-hmm. are more of a destination for coffee and tea and stuff like that. I think convenience is very, very important. So the macro and the micro matters a lot. The micro really matters which specific block you're on. Yeah. Um so, you know, if you're like a top golf, I don't think the micro matters a yeah. ton, like which specific block you kind of just need yeah. to be lucky enough to find a space in the general demographic. Yeah. But real estate is massively important. Uh, it's always better to pay up for the good stuff. Um, but, you know, I think, again, this is where I look at each concept and idea on its own. Sometimes you can't afford the Fifth Avenue location. So, uh, but you might be able to get away by being just a block off, but close enough. Yeah. Uh, and you can get a big discount on, on, on rent for that. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there's a, there's a f- cool factor, a discovery factor to it. Yeah. But I, I, you can't, you don't play too many games in real estate. You just like, you know, the good news is like, you know, kind of works. Yeah. You know, do it, get it right. Don't sacrifice. Don't, it's like with Phil's. That's one of the things. Don't mess up. I was curious because, um, or we talked about how we all obviously have lived in the Bay Area previously before and uh, not there anymore. But I feel like all the media headlines that I see constantly are about, you know, SF going downhill and businesses of all sorts, both small businesses to, you know, giant retailers like moving out of the city due to, you know, crime or whatever it is. And I'm curious, especially as um, someone who, you know, grew up in the Bay Area, who's, you know, whose roots, especially with Phil's, are in the Bay Area. What do you think about that? Is it overblown? Um, is there some truth to it? Uh, how does it impact how you, you feel like the future of the Bay Area will kind of unravel for, you know, emerging entrepreneurs in the brick and mortar space? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I did grow up uh, in, in South San Francisco, but I also grew up in San Francisco because I spent all my days working there. So I know it really well. 
number one, San Francisco is like one of the most beautiful places, you know, like the bridge, the water, the hills, the like, it's got a charm. It's got, it's got so much beauty. Right. Um, but then when you get on the inside, particularly in some pockets and neighborhoods, definitely challenged. So no, I don't think it's overblown. I think San Francisco is beautiful, but it has real challenges. And, um, you know, I think we should figure out as a society and community how to help uh, onboard these people to, you know, onboard them to a better life. But at the same time, you got to hold, you got to hold crime accountable, period, period. You got to be compassionately urgent with hard accountability and much more effective leadership. So this is without knowing the innards of, <laughs> of, of all the discussions and meetings and people. This is from afar, but I, I believe in San Francisco. Yeah. I'm curious, has it impacted from the Phil's point of view, how you guys think about continuing to invest in the community, opening new locations versus expanding nationally? Yeah. How has that impacted you on a business level? Well, you know, when the pandemic started, everything shifted to the suburbs, right? So a lot of our focus on real estate naturally, and we were doing good in the suburbs even before the pandemic, but it accelerated during, and it just, San Francisco, I mean, it really is a location by location question. There's certain locations I'm sure we'd be excited about, and there's certain that are more challenged, but uh, no, I mean, we are not, we're absolutely not opposed to growing in San Francisco, but it needs to be the right location and San Francisco needs to get its act together uh, mm. and support like a vacant space is bad for the community. When are you, you guys know? coming to New York? That's what I want to know. Yeah. You know, I kind of wish we did a long time ago. We will. Hopefully at some point we will. New York. I mean, we have so many great fans in New York. It's amazing. We get so many requests. So at some point we will, I think, and we want to do it right. You have your first two um, customers here, so you're you're, you're I mean, literally, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. obviously, you still have a role on the on the the board, being exec chairman. But how does it feel like when now you're you know someone on the day to day basis is managing you know you and and you know uh, before that you know your, you and your dad's baby, uh, and and yet and yet like you're not you're not doing kind of the day to day things. How how much do you feel the the urge to kind of step in and versus you know how much are you 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 wanting to kind of step out because you're also trying to let other folks kind of take the wheel as well yeah i mean you know the the truth is is uh it's it's definitely not easy making the transition but it's it's uh it's also really good because if you think about it like i've been in the business since i was 10 years old when i was a bodega 17 totally. year old when phil started like i've done enough besides Abercrombie and Fitch for six months selling right, jeans right. at the front and spraying cologne. Uh, <laughs> that was my know. first job as well, by the way. Oh, so really? You know, wow. Common, yeah. <laughs> nice. We need like a pin market <laughs> map, like first <laughs> yeah. job. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, we we collaborate, we talk. I, I'm opinionated about certain things. I'm open to certain things. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I just want what's best for the consumer and the team and the business. So, you know, I, I think it's, and, and I'm really excited about the opportunities that I that I see inside it feels and outside. So uh no, it you know, it's it's been pretty good. It's been pretty good overall. I'm not like um when I'm in something and managing it a hundred percent, I get close to all the details. Yeah. Man. Very much so. <laughs> uh and uh yeah, very much so. I, I don't like layers of of you know management. It's like be close to the details, make sure you get everything right. Mm-hmm. But I'm in that mode when I'm running one thing yeah. full time. When I'm not running something full time, I'm not in that mode. Yeah. You can't be in that mode when you're not running the day to day. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I guess one more question before we transition to rapid fire, which is curious if you have any hot takes about your industry, whether it's like, uh, you know, brick and mortar businesses or the types of founders that run them or things that you're excited about, maybe that other people aren't excited about. Does anything come to mind? You know, more entrepreneurs should be, uh, get interested in brick and mortar. Uh, yeah. And, you know, despite what people think, a great brick and mortar business is a fantastic business. Yeah. Really good business. 
what is it that makes it better than, you know, say someone's choosing between, yeah, opening something versus starting a, you know, B2B SaaS company. Besides it being more fun, which is that's a given. Yeah, yeah well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to make the it? <laughs> it's hard to make the comparison. But I, I, I think you're 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 um uh you feel more connected to people. You're a little bit more fulfilled in some ways because you're forced to interact with more people. Um, you're out there physically touching things, uh, seeing people, um, you know, seeing how things you design impact someone directly. So I think in general, like it's very fulfilling. You can make big impact fast, like opening mm. a space in a community, especially like a community with a lot of people, people will come and give you a try and support you and you can make a real huge impact. So uh, it, it, I don't want to draw the comparison of, is it better than B2B or B2C or tech or not? I think everybody has to do something that they're passionate about, but I think it's, uh, if you have a great brick and motor business, Look at so Chick Fil A. Like Chick Fil A, I think each location does about eight or nine million dollars a year, and they're open six business. days a week. They're That's probably twenty five percent to third, maybe thirty percent four wall profitability. So thirty percent like, of nine million is like almost like three million. Yeah, per location. If if you have a software company that has nine million ARR, that's you know <laughs> just one Chick Fil A. So. You know, totally. and, and then by the way, like the it's fickle, right? Churn and retention on these soft SaaS business very fickle sometimes. B two B maybe less so, but uh, no, I mean Chipotle three million dollars per location, twenty six percent margins per. You know, mm-hmm. so there is a lot of great business to be had, and I think there's a lot of opportunity, and it is competitive. But when you really drill down, if you're really really good, you can do good. And then the other thing I'd say is we need to stop thinking about it as digital versus physical. We need to start yeah. thinking about it as people and customer. Yeah. yeah, this is the important lens to look at it because there's you you don't just do one; you you do both. You do all right. There's mm-hmm. some exceptions, but that's the right way to look at it. Is I'm just I want to make sure I give my customers great value. And what's the best way to do that? Sometimes you need stores. Sometimes you need more digital. Sometimes you need both. Very cool. Larry, want to kick us off with rapid fire? Yeah, absolutely. The intention of these is to answer in in one sentence or less. We'll start off with the founder you look up to most. Oh, man, that's a hard one. The founder I look up to most. (laughs) Well, a founder you look up to. How about that? A founder I look up to. I mean, Brian Chesky comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, He is, yeah, I mean, like just the way he dealt with the pandemic. Yeah. The design sense, uh, the ability to level up, um, just great, great balance of art and science leader, totally. you know, so very, very good, very good instincts too. And yeah. I think he's a learning machine. <clears throat> so those are some good, but not the like, there are so many others, but that's, for that's sure. a quick one for you. Sure. 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 Uh, book that most change your life. The laws of success by Napoleon Hill okay. kind of, you know, one of those you could be perceived as like a self-help kind of book, but there's like six, I think it's 16 principles in that book. Yeah. Fantastic. And actually I read them at a young age. Yeah. It's best to read that at a very young age. Uh, what what job would you want if you couldn't be a founder or investor? You know, I've always envisioned being a hotel concierge, you know, those guys with the big coats and all yeah. the buttons. Like, I feel like I would just crush the experience for every customer. <laughs> <laughs> I would Wait. like, find out their cousins, their all the birthdays of their family. I'd send them gifts, like just absolutely go crazy delighting them. But that that seems pretty exciting. I do love hospitality. Love that. Uh, maybe to, to wrap up, what's your favorite order on the Phil's menu? I would say a Tesora with honey and cream. Tesora means treasure. It's the first blend we created. <clears throat> it's medium-ish uh, roast. Uh, it's a blend. It's delicious and i get it with a little honey and a little cream yeah. and it's fantastic i i can have four of them a day well i know i speak for Steph and say that or or excited to get two to Soros with honey and cream when the in the first new york store pops oh, yeah. up uh, uh jacob really appreciate the time this has been this has been fun yeah, my pleasure thank, you, so thank you both thanks everyone for listening uh you can find us at something you can follow Steph at Steph Moy, M-U-I. 
on Twitter. You can follow myself, Lior, at Elmushin on Twitter. Catch us again next time. Cool. I thought it went well. <laughs>